Welcome to this video course on linear system identification. This course is part of the teaching unit system identification. And in this teaching unit, there are two activities. The first activity is, of course, the theoretical course, and it is split in two parts the linear part and the video course that you're watching is related to this linear part and a non-linear part given by my colleague Thomas Museur. The second activity is the associated lab, the system identification laboratory and again it is split in a linear part given by myself and a non-linear part given by my colleague Thomas Museur. The slide presentation that you have at your disposal on the web page of the course is based on a course that I have taught in the past. The teaching material is far too large for a 15-hour theoretical course, so I had to make some more choices and some of the slides will be skipped during the presentation. As usual, all slides with a red logo on the top right are there for your information and the associated topics are not the subject of examination at the time of the exam. In this course we will consider data-driven modeling based on data that has been obtained from experiments on the system. Very often we do not have a prior first principle model and we will have to select a so-called black box model structure and in this part of the course the black box model structure will be linear and we'll have to identify the underlying parameters. So here's the outline of the course. We'll start with an introduction in which we'll talk about potential applications of the course. Then we'll talk about the system identification procedure and we'll already talk about a little example which is the hair dryer example that will be useful when you start the laboratory that is associated to the course. In section 2 we'll talk about the assumptions that we make on the data generation mechanism so that you have an idea of the underlying assumptions when using the course in well, practice on actual data in the associated lab. In section 3, we'll talk about simulation and prediction. Well, simulation is a concept that is familiar to you. You're simply using the input and a model to generate outputs. Prediction is different. In prediction, you use inputs, right? But also the outputs that you have at your disposal and you use them to predict the output in later stages. And this will lead to the notion of predictor. So in section four, we'll discuss the black box model sets, for instance, ARX model sets, output error model sets that will be used in the course and we'll cover the three first subsections and the two last subsections will not be covered in the course. In section 5 we will do a little sidestep and talk about control and control performance monitoring. So I will introduce the minimum variance controller and roughly speaking this is kind of the best between quotes disturbance rejection controller and we'll also introduce the ARIS index which tells you how well the actual controller compares with respect to the between quotes optimal minimum variance controller in section 6 we talk about model estimation so we have generated data we have selected a model structure so we need now to identify the underlying parameters and for that we are going to use a prediction error cost that is going to be minimized using iterative search methods so in this third subsection there is clearly a link with the course of optimization methods the 
four subsections that will follow will not be covered in the course and this is the same for section 7 that will be skipped in its entirety. Well, section 8 will not be covered in its entirety. We'll focus on bias and variance considerations. We'll talk about the pretreatment of data, that is before you use it for system identification and then we'll focus on model structure selection and model validation this is really the question i have produced a model is it a good model is it a good model for my purposes well section nine is about identification in practice and how you can use matlab to do identification well, this section will be covered in its entirety. I will just skip the last subsection here on feedback. And this section 9 will be especially useful when you do the assignment in the system identification laboratory. Section 10 on iterative feedback tuning. That is an iterative data-driven controller optimization scheme will not be covered. It is there for your information. As usual, if you see typos, mistakes in the slides and the presentation, if you have suggestions on how you could improve the course, please do not hesitate to contact me per email. We will be using MATLAB quite a lot in this course and especially in the associated lab. The system identification toolbox is not covered by the MATLAB student suit. So you have to add this toolbox if you're planning to attend this course. So there are some slight variations in the commands that will depend on your MATLAB version, especially if you have a very old MATLAB version, you should be aware of obsolete commands. But this should not be a problem. You can always use the help functionality in MATLAB and type the command doc ident as I will show you. So as usual, you can type or use the help command on system identification commands such as ARX and you obtain all the help you need. You can also type doc ident and you will have a very good help for the system identification toolbox. So please have a look at this before and during the system identification laboratory. And for instance, what you could have a look at is, for instance, an example, an application of system identification on some process. And here it's a glass tube manufacturing process. Associated with the system identification toolbox comes a graphical user interface, a GUI or app that you can run using the following command, system identification. And then what will appear is a window in which, well, you can do identification using a graphical means in this uh, user-friendly environment. You will not be allowed to use this GUI during the system identification lab. I prefer that you first build up some know-how using traditional MATLAB scripts and commands. But later, when you know what you're doing and when you have built up this know-how, you can use this GUI or app. It's a great tool to obtain models quickly in a user-friendly environment. Well, the laboratory assignment will be available in the web pages associated to the course. And in this assignment, you will work on actual data sets and you will have to apply the theoretical concepts of the course. And at the end of the system identification lab, you should have understood that a system identification is much more than just running a command and accepting the outcome without thinking. There are many traps that you can fall in, for instance, overfitting and oversampling. Experiment design 
data selection, model structure selection, and model validation are key concepts to help you in obtaining a data-driven model that will serve your purposes. In your report, you should bring to the front the understanding of the key concepts that have been tackled in the course. Be critical of the data and the models that you identify. And of course, as usual, an element of originality that will differentiate your work with that of a colleague is always appreciated. Well, the exam will cover all topics that have been tackled during this video course, the classroom course, if there is any, and the system identification laboratory. The main reference for this course is the book System Identification Theory for the User by Leonard Jung, and I follow the notations in the main reference book. This means that the notations might be somehow different from the notations that I've used in previous courses. But this is something that you have to get used to if you want to tackle a new topic. So it is a very good reference if you want to go further than what is done in this course. The second reference covers, well, the little part about control performance monitoring and more in particular the ARIS index. This is something that is becoming increasingly important in industry. Well, to kind of assess if a controller is giving a good performance and well, in this case, it's performance with respect to the ideal disturbance rejection controller. And this leads to this ARIS index. Within the fields of system and control engineering, there are many applications of data-driven system identification. Well, obviously, a first application of system identification is to use the identified model for simulation purposes. Well, a second application is, of course, to use the identified model for control design. Well, there can be an advantage in using system identification because the identified model can sometimes capture aspects that are difficult to capture using first principle modeling. Well, the third application is to use the identified model and use it to construct a predictor. The idea is then that you use the inputs, but that you also use the past outputs to predict the output at present time or with some horizon so that you have a prediction in the future. And the last application is fault detection. So if you then compare the prediction with what is happening on the system, on the actual system, well, this means that if you start to see differences between what happens in the model and what happens on the actual system, what well, this might be a sign that there is something going wrong in the system, that the system is changing. And this might be a well indication of failure in the process. So when we think about modeling, very often we think about first principle modeling and not data driven modeling first principle modeling is modeling using the laws of physics whereas data driven modeling is modeling based on data that has been obtained on the system using experiments first principle modeling is what we have used in the control lab associated to the course of state space control we have used the laws of mechanics to obtain a state space model of a two-wheeled robot. Data-driven modeling is an alternative for first principle modeling and it can be used for systems that are very complex or for systems for which a model is difficult to obtain due to the complex nature of the system. 
for instance, if we come back to this case of the mobile robot, if you want to capture, for instance, high frequency resonances due to resonances in the frame, well, you will not be able to capture them using first principle modeling. But if you use data driven modeling, you might be able to capture these high frequency resonances. So first principle modeling is also called white box modeling. Two types of models are common in the field of system identification, where the modeling is data driven. You have gray box modeling and black box modeling. Well, gray box modeling is something that you have done in the lab that is associated to the course fundamentals of control theory, but you might not have known that it's called gray box modeling. Well, typically you do a step response on the system. Okay, so this is the input. It's a step. And then you look at the output. And for instance, the output might look like this. And when you look at the step response, well, you kind of see the signature of the system and you say, well, if I look here at the start, I see that I have a slope of zero. So it's probably a system with second order and with a slight delay. So what you can say is I'm going to use a model structure that is as follows. So again, two time constants. and a delay, right? And this is called a van der Grinten system, if you remember. So what you'll do then is do curve fitting. You'll fit the output of your model to the response of the system. And in the laboratory associated to the course of fundamentals of control theory, you have done this using the MATLAB function f min search. In some cases, the process is not well known because it's complex and also because you have done experiments on the system, but maybe not with a step input. Okay, so you cannot recognize the signature of the system. So no prior model is known. And then what we'll do is use a so-called black box structure with a given complexity and black box data driven modeling is really the identification of the underlying parameters. We'll encounter several model structures in this course, such as the ARX model or the output error model, for instance. So we've said before that first principle modeling will not always pick up high frequency resonance modes so that there are unmodeled high frequency dynamics. So it might be that the actual frequency response of the system looks like this. And that your, well, first principle model has only picked up the low frequency behavior. If you're satisfied with a well low bandwidth control, then this first principle model will be okay. But if you want a high bandwidth control, then you need to capture these high frequency peaks over here and this is where system identification can offer a solution if you do an experiment design that will excite those modes you can use system identification to identify a model that will pick up these high frequency resonance modes one of the earliest examples of that is the so-called joggable cd player a cd player that you can use when you go jogging so the control engineers had to come up with a robust controller for the pickup mechanism that positions the laser on the right track of the cd and for that they needed a model that was able to pick up the high frequency resonant modes 
and here data driven system identification was used you can find the source here below on the slide as you have seen in the course of my colleague Thomas Museur, model predictive controllers rely on dynamic models of the process to control this process while satisfying a set of constraints. Although MPC controllers and model predictive controllers sometimes use physical models, most of the time, well, empirical models are used and these are up through experiment design and these empirical models take the form of the ARX model the finite impulse response model and very often simply a step response of the system is used and you will find applications of MPC for instance with an ARX model that is covered in this course in many applications such as refining petrochemicals but also other areas such as pulp and paper food processing and polymer production so one of the very important applications of system identification is in prediction prediction use past measurements of both the inputs and the outputs and the predictor is constructed using the identified model and a so-called k step ahead prediction is produced so if k is equal to one you have a prediction one step um, which is corresponding to the sampling period ahead in the future the Predictions can be used to predict floods, avalanches, groundwater level, future energy use, wind gusts, solar radiation, and so on. You'll find many applications in the literature. Well, in the system identification laboratory associated to this course, you will identify models that can be used for flood prediction the input will be the rainfall as measured by rain gorges and the output will be the river flow measured in river flow stations so you can then use the identified models to construct a prediction of the river flow in the future well you can have a look of applications real life applications of flood prediction on this site so if you click on the link this is what you obtain and as you can see well there are no reasons to expect floods in the french part of belgium we are in the summer and it's a very dry summer but if you look at this in the winter and if it's a wet winter the situation might look completely different and there might be zones that are in well flood alert so if you click on objectives and methods and well forecasts this is the typical forecast of the flood system well without going into the details what you see this line that i'm showing now is present so this is the past and this is the future and what you see here are different scenarios for the river flow and they will depend on the scenario that you take for the weather forecast and more in particular for the rainfall that is to be expected we'll come back to that in the system identification laboratory well the idea with fault detection is as follows so the first thing that you have to do is collect data under normal operating conditions so when the system is functioning properly then you use this data to identify a model and validate it and using this model you can then construct a predictor as we will see in this course and here you see how this predictor is constructed the predicted output is constructed from past inputs and past outputs and then what you have to do is look at the difference between the prediction and 
and the actual output of the system and this difference is called epsilon over here but it's called a residual and when this residual in some way becomes different to what you expect you can say that there is a change in the system and probably a fault okay so there are different ways of monitoring epsilon the easiest way is for instance to have a look at the mean and the variance but we will see that there are different ways you can also correlate epsilon with u or correlate epsilon with itself okay and this will lead to well a fault detector so the predictor is constructed from past inputs and past outputs. Well, you can use a linear predictor and apply the IDs of this course, but you can do more complicated things and apply the IDs of the associated course of Thomas Museur and use, for instance, here a neural net for your prediction. We will now turn to the system identification procedure, which will yield a dynamical system. A system is an object in which variables of different kinds interact and produce observable signals. And the signals that are observable and that are of interest to us are usually called the outputs. The system outputs are affected by external stimuli. If these stimuli can be manipulated by the user, they are called inputs. If not, they are called disturbances. There are two types of disturbances, disturbances that can be measured. They could be added as inputs to the system, but they are different to the ones mentioned above because they cannot be manipulated by the user. You have to live with them. And there are, of course, also disturbances that cannot be measured and their influence can only be observed on the output. In this course, well, disturbances will be modeled as stochastic processes, processus stochastique or processus aléatoire in French. So in this course, we're interested in modeling that is constructing an assumed relation among the observed signals. And we're interested in a particular route that is based on experimentation. So we'll do data-driven modeling okay so input and output signals are recorded and subjected to data analysis in order to infer a model and this route is called black box modeling the term black box refers to the fact that we do not have any prior model structure we do not have any id on the signature of the system we do not have any id of the underlying model structure so what we'll do is assume a model structure and well a certain complexity on this model structure identify the model and then use model validation to see if the produced model is a good one if not well we have to postulate or assume a new model structure and redo the identification so we'll see later that identification is really an iterative process sometimes we might even not be satisfied with the data and we'll have to return to experiment design and redo the experimentation on the actual system well in the system identification procedure there will be four basic entities for the construction of a model the first entity is the data and ideally what you should do is design your experimentation carefully and the object of the experiment design will be of course to make sure that the data is maximally informative subject to the constraints at hand one constraint could be for instance that you work on an industrial process that is producing something so that you cannot use any input as you like on this 
process. Sometimes you have to live with the data because you have to use production data. But anyway, if you can, you should make sure that you extract as much information from your system as possible using the data. The topic of experiment design will not be tackled in the system identification lab because you will receive your data set. But anyway, you always have to ask yourself the question, is my data informative enough to identify a model using this data? Experiment design will be further discussed in the next two slides. Well, the second entity is the candidate model the model structure that is going to be used it's a very important and difficult choice to make in the identification procedure if you have information about the system that can be used of course this is going to influence the candidate model but very often you do not have information up front and then you'll have to have a look at well the use of the model for instance is this model going to be used for simulation or is it going to be used for prediction and this will influence the candidate models and this means that you have to know the formal properties of the models and these will be discussed further in the course well the third entity is a rule that you can use to infer the model to identify the model model quality is typically based on how well the model performs when it attempts to reproduce the measured data so what we'll do in this course is use a rule which is based on a cost a prediction error cost really the sum of squares of the prediction errors and the prediction errors are the difference between the predicted outputs and the measured outputs the fourth entity is model validation it's a very important step and you should always test if the identified model is good enough for your purposes so you should go a little bit further than just look at the prediction cost using the compare function for instance there are other methods that can be pursued for instance correlation autocorrelation of the residuals and correlation of the residuals with the inputs this will be further investigated in this course it is very important as we will see later that when you do model validation you should use part of the data that has not been used in the identification procedure so that you're validating your model on new data this will be explored further down the course as well so here you have a graphical representation of the system identification procedure so First of all, you have to generate your data set and remember that at best you should always use experiment design. This data set is going to be used at the different stages of the identification procedure. Then you have to choose a model set and this is really choosing, for instance, as we will see later, an ARX model, an output, mod, output error model or some other model structure but when you have selected the ARX model structure for instance well then you also have to have a look at how many parameters in the A polynomial how many parameters in the B polynomial and so on this is really choosing the model set and the choice of the model set is well will be depending on the information that you have up front and it will also be based on the objective for instance prediction and simulation and depending on the objective well you will either choose an arx model or an output error model for instance arx models are known to be very good in prediction whereas output error models will are best used for simulation once you have chosen the model set, you can then have a look 
at the criterion in this course here the, this 15 hour course will always use the prediction error the sum of squares of the prediction errors what you might do is filter the data this will produce an estimate and once you have your estimate you have a model well you should use your validation data to validate the model if you're satisfied you're done if you're not well you have to go back and will adapt the model structure in some cases you might even have to go back to the data generation here and regenerate your data rethink your experiment design so as you can see the system identification procedure is iterative well, we've said it before, experiment design is a very important ingredient of the system identification procedure. Sometimes instead of experiment design, we say design of experiments or DOE. One key idea is that, well, the experiment should be performed under conditions that are as close as possible to the ones under which the model is going to be used. Well, for instance, if you plan to identify a model to predict floods of river using rain flow, river flow data sets, you should, of course, select episodes where the river is in a near flood situation. That is when the river flow is high. This makes sense in a near flood situation. Very little of the rain will percolate in the soil as it will be saturated with water most of the rain will end up in the river so the system behaves approximately linearly when the soil is not saturated with water part of the rain will end up in the ground and the remaining part in the river so the system will behave non-linearly it would make no sense to select data in a low water situation where the soil is not saturated and where the system behaves non-linearly to identify a model for a situation, a working point where the process behaves linearly. So there are a number of rules that you should follow for experiment design. So we'll start first with a single input, single output system. And there the input signal should excite all relevant frequencies. For instance, if you take an input that is simply constant and you wait long enough until that the transient effects have disappeared, well, at the output, you'll also have a constant. And what you'll be able to identify is the static gain of the system. Similarly, if you use a sign as input and you wait long enough until the transient effects have disappeared, you will have also a sign at the same frequency at the output. It might be shifted a bit, it might be attenuated, but because the system is linear, it will still be a sign. So what you'll be able to identify really is the gain at that frequency and the phase shift at that frequency. If you put an input step at the input of your system, then you might have a response that looks like this. Okay, so this is better now because we are exciting all frequencies, but still we put the focus on the low frequencies because of this large large portions of time where the signal is constant so what we should do is use a prbs sequence so a pseudo random binary sequence and it's basically a step and then followed by another step etc so in a pseudo random binary sequence you can set the level and the number of transitions between low and high in a given 
periods. What is also, of course, important is the sampling frequency. Typically, what you should do if you know the rise time of the system is take 10 to 15 samples per rise time. This is, of course, a rule of thumb. If the system is linear and multivariable, there are several input signals and each input signal should excite all the relevant frequencies, but also the signals should behave independently of one another. So let us take an example where in practice the independence of the inputs will not be met in practice. So again, we'll take a well rain river flow system. So assume that we measure the river flow at this point. So this is the output and that we have a model or we try to identify a model with two inputs. So the first input is the average rainfall in region one. And the second input is the average rainfall in a region two. Okay, so for good experiment design, we need lots of episodes where, for instance, it's raining in R1 and region one and not in region two and vice versa. In practice, in a country like Belgium, when it's raining, well, it's raining over the whole country. So there's a big chance that R1 and R2 will not be well behaving independently and this will lead to a bad experiment design and of course the models that will be identified will be of poor quality so what could happen for instance is that if you do an impulse response on r1 okay so this is my input over here and you look at F, the river flow that for instance you see something like this happening so this makes sense right the river flow is going up and then it goes back to zero so this would be the impulse response for the first input and if you do something similar for the second input so same input but now on the second input so an impulse that you see something like this you will so this is again the flow over here so you will agree with me that this is not very intuitive so we have an impulse at the input for the average uh, rainfall and you see that the river is going down so what has happened is that well the data set is not informative enough to identify a model with two inputs okay so really what you obtain is a crappy model of course for this system it's impossible to do the actual experiment design because you have to live with the data that nature has given you of course if you would have an industrial process what you would do is do your experiment design in such a way that the two inputs behave independently well if the system becomes non-linear well things become a lot more difficult and then your input signals should cover the entire working range so that all relevant operating points are covered well if the system behaves non-linearly and you want to identify it around one operating point using a linear system well then you should excite the system around that operating point but if the system is non-linear and you want to capture or identify a non-linear model then you should really have input signals that cover all operating points
So by now you should have understood that experiment design is really important and that you should spend some time in choosing the input signals in such a way that you extract as much information as you can from the system. If you don't do a very good job in experiment design, well, you might end up with a crappy model. This is also called the bullshit in bullshit out principle.